All right. Happy Tuesday. So we're going to start our little ethics seminar here uh, with a PowerPoint that I just ripped off of one of my colleagues. So this is actually PowerPoint, which is super weird. I don't usually like PowerPoint, but um, this is not code material. Um, so there's nothing for me to like really demonstrate. So uh, forgive me. I'll try not to read stuff to you here. Um, so one of the things that makes software engineering different than just development or different than just programming or, you know, your whatever. Um, I hate the word hacker, but um, it, it came from if you're a hack, right? You're, you're not actually professional. You're just kind of doing this thing. Hector, my friend, thank you so much for dropping those bits and donating to the Student Scholarship Fund over at the University of Michigan Dearborn College of Engineering and Computer Science. So uh, we, we actually, in computer science and, and particularly software engineering, have stolen um, a lot of what we'll call the profession of engineering from the traditional physical engineering disciplines. Uh, and what makes it this profession right, is that it has some body of knowledge here. Um, and we, we understand that all of this, uh, the study that goes into it, and you have to apply judgments to it, uh, GG, yeah, we can talk about the HashMap Lab later. Uh, we'll probably have time after this. So looking at how we can utilize our resources, um, ideally for the benefit of mankind is part of the quote here, um, which is what takes this to the, the professional level, the professional standard here, is it's more than just, hey, I know stuff that I can do stuff. right? To call something a profession means we're actually going to organize around it and hopefully have a good purpose for it. Here, which is really cool. Uh, so one of the things that they look for in this accreditation, this is ABET, I forget who they are, but they're our accreditation body for our engineering degrees here at uh, U of M, and a, a relatively common accreditation body for engineering programs around the country. Uh, they want to see certain things in your degree program. So one of them is an understanding of professional and ethical responsibility. Hence, we have an ethics seminar presentation. I, I don't even know what the word seminar means, uh, but a little presentation. I'll talk about it. 
especially early on. Now we don't necessarily have enough time to do this in like the intro to programming class, uh, but this is generally for undergrads, like your second programming class. You're probably still a freshman here, so we want to start you thinking about ethics early here. Um, so again, how you become a professional, right? It's not just, hey, I can write some code or I can run some code I found online, right? Again, that's sort of where we get the term hacker. You're just a hack if you're just running out of people's code, don't really know what you're doing. But it's study, experience, and practice. Um, generally, there's a, a defined comprehensive education that goes into it. So for any professional organizations, or professional bodies, they set what the standard is to get into that profession, right? So as a medical professional, there's certain comprehensive education programs they have to go through before you can be licensed as a medical doctor or whatever you need to be there in um, that field. And then, again, uh, this idea of serving humanity is what, what takes this from just I have skills and knowledge to being a true professional. Uh, I know it sounds kind of crazy, but this is uh, one of my favorite things about the field is that we can actually do good things with it. Right? It, we're not just benefiting ourselves. So engineering as a profession, right? definitely there's an indispensable need for engineers. Right? All sorts of engineering here, uh, particularly software engineering as like everything today runs on computers. Right? I mean, literally, probably everyone now walks around with a computer in their pocket. Right? Our, our phones are amazing uh, tools here. Um, engineering requires discretion and judgment. That's actually hard to standardize. Right? There, there's judgment and, and ideas that you have to put into well, what choices am I making here. Uh, we don't have unlimited resources, so we can't do anything and everything. We have to make choices. What is the right thing for us to focus on? Uh, it's knowledge and skills not commonly possessed by the general public. Again, as a profession here, uh, if everybody could just do it, it wouldn't need to be a profession. Um, this group consciousness promotes knowledge, professional ideas, and social services. Uh, a legal status as a profession. Uh, a well-formulated standards of admission and a code of ethics. Uh, and this code of ethics is super cool. Um, so there's uh, two out there we're going to look at. Um, yeah, so why, why should engineers follow a code of ethics? Um, so interestingly, right, other professions, doctors, lawyers, um, they, they deal directly with their clients, the people who benefit from those services. We don't. I mean, even physical engineers, the people who build cars and bridges and roads and things, they're, they're not like asking, hey, did you drive over this road? Did you enjoy your, your trip over the road? I mean, they wouldn't want the feedback in Michigan anyway, but um, we, we don't really interact with them directly. Um, so depending on what the organizational requirements are, uh, certain engineering levels require a bachelor's degree, not a master's or higher, and, and you know, medical doctors need their medical degree and, and things like that. Um, lawyers need their, is it a Juris Doctorate or something, a JD degree? I forget what it is. Um, but they all set their own requirements. So generally for engineering it's a bachelor's. Um, it's, it's a little bit lower level. You don't have to go quite so specialized here. Um, so when we're dealing with people and interacting, there's etiquette, which is our customs and norms. There's laws, which are the hard and fast, you do this or you go to jail or have some sort of penalty. It's not always jail. There's morals, what we think is right and wrong. And then there's ethics, uh, which is surprisingly different from morals here. So our etiquette, right, is the customs that sort of what is accepted behavior, what's normal here for our etiquette. The laws, right, the rules and regulations that you do this or there's some consequence here, uh, generally around safety. It is one of the big ones here. And as we get into self-driving vehicles, uh, that, that's a very interesting piece here, is who's going to be liable if a self-driving vehicle hits somebody or crashes and kills somebody? Because all of them have those ter giant terms and conditions, the 10 pages that no one ever reads, and you just click the button, yes, I accept the terms and conditions, that say, we're not actually fully driving. You're still responsible to be looking and paying attention, and you need to take over if something bad's going to happen. Whether or not that's going to hold up in court, I, I think Tesla's been successful so far. Um, last I recall, I mean, they've, they've a couple people have died while in their, you know, quote, self-driving mode. Um, and I don't think they've gotten sued for it yet, um, probably because of all those waivers. So but that's an interesting, as we move more technology in that, that road, what uh, rules do we have around that? And then morals are personal rules of right and wrong. Uh, these come from your upbringing, your religious beliefs, and some societal influences here. 
But ethics is a, a, a codified set of moral behaviors and moral definitions of this is the right thing to do or not here. It's not personal. Right? A, a code of ethics at this point is a, an accepted grouping of these things. It's not saying, hey, I think that's wrong. It's, okay, This the code of ethics clearly says this is wrong. So um, there's a big difference between what's legal and what's moral. Right? Not everything that is legal is right and good for people. And we might say not moral. But legalizing morality is a really slippery slope. Um, and then, you know, different people have different feelings about what is moral and what's not moral. And uh, the, the law has trouble with this because it's observable behavior only. Right? And laws can be enacted by immoral regimes. We, we see uh, currently Russia is doing all sorts of things that they say are perfectly legal in Russian law. It's a giant mess. Let's, I don't want to get into that and get all worked up again. Um, so, just for an example, if we know there's an, a new industrial waste byproduct that's environmentally harmful, but it's new, so there's no regulation, there's no law that says you can't do this. You can't go pump this industrial waste out into the lake here. We know it's harmful, but the law says nothing about it because it's brand new. Right? Is that morally good just because the law says it's not illegal? No. Right? I, I think that one's pretty obvious. Um, this next one, though, is a little bit more of a stretch, right? We need to uh, needs a product to conduct an experiment, and you just purchase it from the junkyard using personal funds, and then reimburse yourself from your office supplies fund. But the government requires going through a purchasing agent because this is the process to make sure that yada, 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 everything happens the right way, and you're buying from whatever people. Was that right or wrong? Is that is that a moral thing to we just need it quick? Let's just go get it ourselves and reimburse ourselves to the, the general like supply fund instead of going through the defined process. Technically against the process, you know, probably was wrong. But if this experiment is important, right? Well, what is the cost of not doing it here? Um, I, I mean, I'm sure there's probably other work to be done while you wait. So it's probably not going to harm anything to wait. So this this is a little bit gray, right, in, a, in terms of morality. Um, I think most people would fall on the side of that was probably wrong because you, you're supposed to go through the purchasing agent. But was anybody harmed? No, he just bought one thing, right? There's one little part from a junkyard here. So um, and another one, can you ban bad thoughts right? in some moral codes? Thinking a thought is equivalent to performing the act. Can, can we write laws to say you can't think bad things? No, that obviously we can't. So there's no proof of it, right? Now, can they ban you from criticizing the government? Yes, and, and Russia is currently doing that, cracking down on their independent journalists for criticizing the government and actually reporting on the war here because that's expressed behavior. Um, they can't stop people from thinking things, but they can stop them and arrest them for protesting in the streets. Right? It, sorry. Um, so professional ethics then. So ethics itself is a study of morality here, and professional ethics set a standard for what the conduct of that profession should be. And most technical societies have some sort of written body of ethics that they say, hey, if you're going to join this technical, this organization, this group, professional society, you need to ascribe to this code of ethics. And this is how we're going to define ourselves here. So there's fundamental principles, and then there's fundamental canons that kind of expand the principles with a set of rules. So here's the principle, and then the, the canon describes, okay, this is how we go about fulfilling that principle here. Oh, ABET, Accreditation Board for Engineering and Technology. I know what it means now. So one of the fundamental principles here is that engineers should uphold and advance the integrity, honor, and dignity of the engineering profession by and then some canon. Using their knowledge and skills for the enhancement of human welfare, being honest and impartial, and serving with fidelity to the public, their employers, and clients. And this is a hard list here. Striving to increase the competence and prestige of the engineering profession and supporting the professional and technical societies of their disciplines. Whew, I did read that to you, I'm sorry. I was trying not to read things, but there's not too much to say here. So one of the things we should do then, right, to uphold this principle, 
right? We should hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public in the performance of our professional duties. Right? The, the safety, health, and welfare of the public is more important than what we're trying to accomplish. That we can't be sacrificing health, wealth, health and welfare of the public just to meet our goals. And this gets tricky, um, especially when you look at things like Bitcoin and, and the environmental costs of just essentially wasting a ridiculous amount of power to have a virtual currency. Um, I, don't, I, I struggle with this. And like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I own some crypto because I have the fear of missing out and, and want to be in on it. But um, it, it's very wasteful. I, it's so that's I, I think goes against a little bit of our, our health and welfare of the public if we're just wasting electricity. Uh, we should perform services only in areas of their competence. So this one is probably more important for the physical engineering, like civil engineering people. If you don't know how to build a bridge, don't build a bridge. Right? Don't be the lead engineer designing a bridge if you don't know what you're doing. Um, we shall issue public statements only in an objective and truthful manner. Act in professional manners for the employer or client as faithful agents or trustees. Avoid conflicts of interest. Build professional reputation on the merits of their services and not compete unfairly. Um, act in a manner to uphold and enhance the honor, integrity, and dignity of the profession. So I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of this one here because uh, very few things upset me as much as malware. Right? People using their, their software abilities to go and cheat and steal and ruin things for other people, it upsets me a lot. Um, and it, you know, it, it makes people look down upon software engineers. Right, so that one's uh, that one's got me sad. And then we shall continue the professional development throughout their career and should provide opportunities for the professional development of those engineers under their supervision. I love this one as well. So as you're rising up in the ranks, you shall be providing opportunities for professional development of anyone you're supervising as well. Right, which is super cool, um, and I think this is amazing. A, a lot of times you'll hear about organizations that have some really weird toxic cultures and the, the engineering manager doesn't want to let any of their star engineers go so he sabotages them so that they can't move up to other places in the company. Uh, specifically Uber. They are a nasty, nasty company. Please don't go work there. Um, it, it's just awful. I hope they've gotten better but it's it's terrible. Uh, really toxic place to go, to go. So, right, supporting others is, is super huge. So, in terms of conflicts, Right? Something that's factual is really easy. I say it's snowing outside and you say no, it's warm and sunny. That's, that's a fact. We can go and verify that really quickly. Right? How we're applying something based on some information. It's a little bit more abstract, a little bit harder. Purely conceptual without any actual application here is even harder. And then moral issues. I think it's wrong, you think it's right. You know, we can argue all day long and we're not going to change each other's minds because morality is a personal belief here. Um, and I, I don't know of anybody who's ever changed their morals because someone told them they were wrong. If you, have, if you have an example of that, I would love to hear it. But I'm pretty sure nobody changes their mind because we told them they're wrong. Um, so should drivers be allowed to speed? It's a bit of a moral issue. Right? We, we have a law, we have a regulation. Uh, my, my kids ask me all the time why I'm always driving faster than the speed limit. And I say, well, usually you can go five over the speed limit. And this is fine. And that's about how fast traffic generally goes. And if I'm going slower than that, then I'm impeding traffic and I'm getting in the way. And they're like, but dad, the speed limit's this. And yeah, but we don't do that. Usually, you know, you can go up to nine over and you'll probably not get the ticket to hit 10 over. And eh. So uh, a little more conceptual here is speeding without adverse driving conditions going greater than 70 on our freeways or with adverse driving conditions, speeds that will cause an accident. So it is technically speeding to be driving 70 in the snow on the freeway because you're likely to cause an accident at that point. Um, a more applicable issue, so this was just conceptual, is this here and then an actual application. So there's a little bit of rain here. Is John speeding when he skids off the road traveling 55 on a highway posted for 70. Was he speeding? Well, he wasn't even going the max. He was going a little bit slower. There was some rain. He might have been going even slower. But did you expect to slide off because of the rain? Probably not. Usually we have pretty good tires nowadays. The road don't pull up the water. The hydroplaning stuff is scary. Like if the water's like just enough, the hydroplaning's no good. And then 
factually here. I got stopped for speeding. Which was out of calibration? The radar gun or my speedometer? Officer, my speedometer said 70. I don't know what's wrong here. Well, the radar gun said this. Right? We can figure out one or the other which one was right or wrong pretty easily. Um, other types of ethical issues. Conflicts of interest, whistleblowing, safety environmental, product liability, public service. There's all sorts of interesting ones here. There's a whole YouTube thing. I can post these if anyone... I don't think anyone's actually going to go watch them, but I'll post it if anyone wants to click links. Um, so generally, we have limited funds. Uh, there are very few places in the world where they'll say, yeah, spend any money you want. Probably nowhere. Right? So if we have to make some sort of decision based on the limited funds that are affecting the health and welfare of people, it can be a little difficult. So if we're making software and it only runs on some platforms that affects the public, right? Turns out nowadays web applications pretty much run everywhere. You don't have to just build a Windows application or a Mac application or a mobile application. Like if you build a website, most anybody can get to it, right? What if our software uses lots of bandwidth? Looking at you, Netflix. Right? Is using up 25% of the, the nation's bandwidth a good thing? A bad thing? Is it right? Is it wrong? Do we care? What about writing programs that don't secure data? This one uh, irritates me, but I, I work with healthcare data at work, so uh, HIPAA is a big thing here, and uh, violating healthcare confidentiality is, is big, big trouble, um, even personally. So that one's interesting. So if we were a physical engineer and we could spend a million dollars on guardrails, some information about guardrails, great. Do we want to put it on a two-lane scenic mountain road there, where if a car falls off, they will pretty much certainly die, but only 20 people a day travel on that road? Or do we want to put it on a four-lane highway where there's only a 10% chance of death, but 22,000 cars a day go on the road? Well, let's actually do some math here and let's look at it. So at the rates of you know, cars per day and the number of times you're going to fall off here and uh, the other thing, which one is more likely to save more lives? Well, it turns out the highway, right? It's used more often, right? And if you look at how much it's used more often, how more often that happens, that sort of thing, we can quickly see, okay, we can boil this down pretty easily, but it's not always quite that easy. Uh, another one, this one is failing to give credit here. If engineer A doesn't credit engineer B, is that right or wrong? Is that ethical right? in, in the code of ethics? And actually, it's not because it, there is a code of ethics saying you shall issue public statements only in an objective and truthful manner, right? So if you're saying, hey, who worked on the bridge here? It's not a truthful manner if you're omitting the help of Engineer B. Poor Engineer B just wanted to be in the credits, right? So giving credit even comes down to an, an, an ethical issue here. Uh, do, yes, yes, yes. Sure. It was on ethical. Yep. All right. If you are an engineer at a defense contractor reviewing work of subcontractors, you determine that subcontractors made submissions with excessive costs, time delays, or substandard work. You tell your management to reject the jobs and require subcontractors to, to correct the problem. And management says, no, shut up, go away, because they're probably getting a kickback from that subcontractor. Who knows? That's another issue here. Um, is, do you have an ethical obligation or right to continue pushing the issue or say, hey, I told management, that's it, that's all I have to do? And this one gets a little tricky. Right? What, what is sub-quality work going to do in terms of affecting the health and public welfare, especially of defense contract systems? Well, could have some big issues. I guess it depends on what you're working on, maybe. So... Your primary obligation to protect the safety, health, property, welfare of the public. They'll notify their employer and other authorities as appropriate, saying, you know, you shouldn't complete, sign, or seal plans or certifications that are not a design safe to the public, yada, yada, yada. If your employer insists on such unprofessional conduct, notify the proper authorities, withdraw from further service on the product, project. Uh, they, no, I've never um, not been given credit for something I did, but... Um, we, we're not, I don't know. No, it's never happened to me. 
So it's not necessarily a danger to public health or safety. It's just sub-quality work or extra charges here. So they're kind of wasting some funds, perhaps, here. Um, so they said, if you feel compelled, go for it. But there's no requirement here. You did the thing, you talked to the people about it, and they said, okay, fine, shut up about it here. So you don't have an ethical obligation to continue to an effort to secure a change in the policy or report it, but you have the right to do so as a matter of personal conscience if you think it was so egregious. So they'll, they'll say, if you want to, go for it, but we're not going to require you in the Code of Ethics. Sure. So we are required, if we subscribe to a Code of Ethics and want to call ourselves professionals, to behave in an ethical manner, and conflicts do occur. And these things happen all the time. There are various moral theories that can be used to settle moral issues here, uh, and resource allocation is probably one of the bigger issues we're going to run into. Here is how do we allocate the right resources here? Uh, we don't need this one. That's fine. All right, that wasn't so bad for a PowerPoint presentation. But I do want to show you this uh, over as gray ball, I think. Gray ball. There's a good write up here. Is it Printed Post? I thought. I think the Guardian had a better write-up about it. I don't remember who it was. I had a link somewhere. Time? Maybe it's up in the post. So the company Uber here had this tool known as Grayball, which would identify and steer its drivers away from potential threats. So as they aggressively pushed into Europe, the taxi cab unions were very anti-Uber, Uber, Uber, damn, um, and they would uh, occasionally try and call an Uber driver to a certain location, take them out and beat them for not driving for the taxi union and daring to work with their competitor. So this Rayball technology was started with the idea that they want to protect their drivers from this sort of behavior. Again, whether or not you think their expansion into Europe aggressively was right or wrong, that's a, that's a separate story, but the software itself, if you're we working as a software engineer or a data scientist trying to, hey, how do I identify who might be a malicious person here? How do we keep our drivers safe? Great idea, right? Sounds really cool. The problem is that they then expanded it into cities here in the U.S. where cities or municipalities were banning the use of Uber. So one of the things they did is if the app was in close proximity to a police station or the government building, or if the card on file was linked to a police credit union, they would link them into the Grayball system and not send drivers there because they could be fined for operating where Uber shouldn't be. At that point, um, hmm, are we being very ethical? Right? Well, what started with a great project, right? Let's keep our drivers safe and not let them get beat up by the taxicab unions. Great. I don't have any issues with that. Once we start using it here in the U.S. and keeping them from getting fines here, right, in Portland, Oregon, 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 Oregon? I would say, I like to say that's Oregon, but I don't say Oregon. I think that's how you're supposed to say it. I don't know. I'm not native. Um, every driver could be fined up to $3,700 for working with Uber back in 2014 before they were officially licensed and regulated and approved by the city. So Uber continued doing that anyway, and they started using Grayball to keep their drivers from getting ticketed. Are we now being ethical? Right? I mean, no. We're, we're flaunting regulations and, and, and rules and laws and saying, oh, we don't care. We're just going to not let our drivers get fined here, but we're going to keep operating when the city says we, we can't be. Right? It was operating illegally against the, the laws here. This one was, was pretty clear. Yeah, thank you, Bell. Definitely unethical here at this point. So what would we do as an Uber engineer, as a software engineer working on the Grayball project or code for it? Right? Uber says its software is completely legal. It keeps its drivers safe more often than circumventing Sting operations. We're still using it to keep our drivers safe, but we're also doing this unethical thing with it. Well, crap. 
And this is hard. Um, so it also denies people who are violating terms of service. I think if you, I don't know how, whatever those sorts of things are, bad, bad um, passengers can get gray balled here and banned from the service. So still has a legitimate use, but is being used badly. Um, and this, this is just one of the awful things at Uber because um, they're such a terrible company. But ethics is difficult. Um, but having that code of ethics, so there was the ACM um, of ethics here. So ACM is the Association for Computing Machinery. They're one of the older orgs here. Um, started with computer stuff. 75 years advancing computing as a science and profession. What is 75 years ago? It's like 1950, just before 1950? Wow. That was like back when they built the bomb machine. This was super cool. Um, this is Alan Turing's bomb machine to break the, um, oh my goodness, what was it called? The Enigma machine that the Nazis used for encryption. He built this, or helped design and build the bomb machine. I'm sure it wasn't just him. Um, but they were able to, 3,500 Enigma messages intercepted each day and decipher them within two to four hours. Because was, you had to dis decipher it, break it quick enough to break their code to figure out what it was. It was super cool. Um, there's a whole set of videos and things. We used to do an Enigma project, but then people started Googling for it, and it turns out it's a common thing, and people have Python programs for Enigma, and I was sad. I waited for a fun project. Um, Anyway, so yeah, 75 years ago, their code of ethics here, they have their own set here. Yes, find cookies. Use necessary cookies only. Look at that option here. So you can look at the general ethical principles, contribute to society and human well-being, acknowledging all people are stakeholders in computing, avoid harm, be honest and trustworthy, be fair and take action not to discriminate, respect the work required to produce new ideas, inventions, creative work, and computing artifacts, Respect privacy. This one's a big deal, especially when we look at data science. Um, looking at you, Google, for selling ads. I mean, we're essentially agreeing to give them our data when we use Gmail and their Android operating system. Right? We're saying, sure, Google, have my info. Okay. Uh, I actually have a, a, a former colleague who now works at Shopify in their privacy team. It sounds super interesting. Uh, what they're trying to do to make sure Shopify it's sort of on the up and up. I mean. They make money by selling things to people, so they definitely need to like run ads and say, oh, you like these sorts of things? Why don't we show you more of those sorts of things? But how do we do that in a privacy-respecting manner and give you, thanks to Europe, the uh, GDPR stuff, the right to remove your data? It's actually really, really hard to remove data from a system right? when we have all these different sources of data that we pull in. Uh, it turns out Facebook even buys information about you. You'd think Facebook would like know everything about you, but it goes out and buys more information from other companies to learn more about you, to give you better ads, so they can make more money from their advertisers. Um, honor confidentiality and the professional responsibility. I mean, there's a whole set of things in here, which is really cool. Um, high quality process and products of professional work. Again, I'll, I'll argue unit tests. Right? Any code that's worth testing or worth, worth writing is worth testing. Right? How do we know we have high quality unless we've tested it? Uh, again, you know, it's, it's a resource allocation issue. And when it finally comes down to it, what, what am I spending my time on? What is the company spending its resources on if it's going to take me 10 times as long to get to 100% code coverage as, well, I can get to like 75% with, you know, a quarter of the time. How, how, how much is enough? And that, that can be difficult. Um, high standard of professional competence, conduct, and ethical practice. Know the existing rules pertaining to professional work. Right? Rules are important to follow. Uh, accept and provide appropriate professional review. This one's really cool. Uh, we, we tend to have an issue in the industry with brilliant jerks who think they know too much and they can just be rude to everybody and it doesn't matter. Uh, and people put up with them because they, they write really good stuff. That's awful. right? So appropriate professional review is important. Evaluations of computer systems or impacts including analysis of possible risks. Uh, this one is huge as well, especially when we start looking at applications of data science. If we train our data and we have biases in that process, we're going to produce more biases in the result. So it turns out when you look at the criminal history of people in America 
and you analyze, okay, uh, there was a, you know, a, a system they put in place, I forget which state it was, um, uh, recidivism, recidivism, I don't even know how to spell the word, oh my goodness, um, so what was the article, or criminal, um, committing crime again, I forget, we'll see if we can find it here. This one it? Uh, nope, that's self-driving cars. This one might be a little older now. This one it? Um, this might have been it. Oh, this is just an opinion. Uh, so anyway, so they, they took a bunch of criminal um, history data and said, okay, depending on what crime you had and your demographics and these sorts of things, how likely were you to commit another crime to try and reform our parole system and to focus the limited resources on doing most active parole work on people most likely to commit crimes again. So it turns out they fed the data through and uh, when it came back out and would rate people and say, how likely are you to uh, commit another crime? It said people who were black or of color were much more likely to commit crimes again. That is what the data said, yes, but the data itself was biased because of a policing bias against people of color, right? Turns out more often or not than white people would get away with it and not go back to prison for their crimes. But parole officers would be harder on people of color. So the system was trained on data with assumptions, with biases, and it spit out a result that was also biased. Uh, so we do need to be careful then at what the possible risks are of training systems on data with biases. And that's a really hard problem to do. That's one of the interesting uh, new research areas here is uh, explainable AI. Trying to, to have the AI as it's learning data and making decisions and, and deciding what to do here, be able to give a nice clear track and trail of, okay, if this is what I analyzed, this is what happened here. Uh, so it's an X AI is a super cool, um, look at this. Like the first hit here, this is gonna be great, right? I don't know what aim multiple is, but sure. Explainable AI is the new big thing here. Right? So this, this is uh, a new interesting place of research here. Again, analyzing possible risk, being able to explain our AI is really useful for that sort of thing. Um, only work in areas of competence. Right? If you don't know what you're doing, you need to tell somebody. This is one of the worst things junior engineers can do, is just sit on a task and sit on a task and sit on a task and not reach out for help. Right? It, nobody is expecting junior engineers and new developers and new data scientists to know everything. So if you are given a task and you don't know what to do, you need to go out and ask for help. Right? Uh, it just slows everything down if you don't tell anyone that you're struggling with it and then you miss your, your milestones and your deadlines here. Uh, foster public awareness, understanding computer-related technologies and their consequences. Right? Some of the consequences are really good. We've done amazing things with technology and we continue to do so. There's really cool stuff that's happening thanks to all of the, our technology. Um, access communicating, communi computing and communication resources only when authorized or compelled by the public good. This one is super interesting here. Compelled by the public good here. Um, sure, uh, there are websites now when you go out and they will run JavaScript code behind the scenes, which means your browser is running the code to mine Bitcoin for them. Right? And that's actually someone's arguing that this is probably a more fair way than running ads for you to get the free content, free whatever you're getting from them, to give up some of your computing power to mine Bitcoin for them so they can make some money mining Bitcoin because so many people run ad blockers. Now, that's another interesting ethical question. Is it, is it ethical to run an ad blocker? If I go out to a website like uh, NewYorkTimes.com and I block their ads, they? I think they have ads, don't they? Felt like they had it. Oh, we might not get ads because we're on the U of M network. Okay, let's go to someone else. Um, how about, uh, what's another news site? Where, where should we try? How about the free, why not, our free press? This is Detroit Free Press. They're going to have, I'm subscribed, I'm probably not going to the ads, dang it. <laughs> there we go, okay, we still have an ad. Uh, imagine that I wasn't signed in. So would it be ethical to block the ads that essentially fund this organization from putting out this content. 
Yes? No? I don't know. I, I actually had a, a friend of mine uh, challenge me on this, so I have since have not run an ad blocker for several years now, and have just if the website irritates me so much with the ads, I just don't go there. So it sort of kind of filters some of that behavior as well. Um, that's an interesting ethical dilemma, right? Because one of the things that they're assuming is that if they put the content out, they'll make money from their advertisers based on the number of people looking at it. And again, then you get these terrible you know, feedback systems where all the articles are, are now clickbait. Like, ooh, look at this top new hot news thing, and it's nothing really interesting at all. They just want you to click on it. Sure, uh, that, that causes its own sort of issues here, but is it ethical to block ads? I don't know, it reduces network bandwidth usage. That's a good thing, right? Maybe. Um, design systems and imp design and implement systems that are robust and usably secure. Usably secure is a really cool word here because security always trades off usability, right? There, there's always a push and pull when you have security concerns and usability concerns. The more secure it is, the harder it is to use in general, right? Because it just puts more barriers up and more barriers up and more barriers up here. Uh, leadership principles. Which is super cool. Uh, all sorts of good ones here. Manage personal personnel and resources to enhance the quality of working life. Right? Be a good people manager when we get there. Um, all sorts of nasty stories coming out from I said um about that game most recently. The Cyberpunk game. What what company did that? Uh, was that Bethesda? No, it wasn't Bethesda. Yeah. Cyberpunk. They're they're like the like British company. Let me look it up here. Let's see. Um, cyberpunk.net. You've got to see their name in here somewhere, right? But they had, um, yeah, CD Projekt Red, or CD Projekt. Um, they had initially come out and said, hey, you know, everyone likes this game, but we're not going to have forced overtime. The, the gaming industry is notorious for last-minute deadlines and crunches and pushes, and, and it's, it's a pretty awful work environment sometimes. So they said, hey, we're not going to require any mandatory overtime. We're going to treat our developers nicely. We're going to make them, they were going to work regular work weeks here, and if we have to push the deadline out, we'll push it out. Well, they pushed it out, I think it was twice, and then after that they went back on the policy and said, well, if they want to work overtime, we'll pay them overtime. Right, and you know, they're asking to do it, which whether or not that is... I, I think that's an issue in and of itself. Um, they're like, then some of the, the teammates are, are working overtime and some are not and have all sorts of issues here. Uh, but treating them nicely here is, is a little bit rough, right? Managing and making sure the quality of working life is good here is important. And this one actually usually will help your business, right? If you're keeping your employees happy, they're more likely to stay, which should be a good business decision, that sort of thing, unless you want to have a certain amount of turnover. Um, create opportunities for members or of the organization or group to grow with professionals. Right? Don't keep them stuck in the role just because they're really good at it. Allow them to grow as a professional. More responsibilities and things. Uh, use care when modifying or retiring systems. Right? Be careful when we change things or get rid of old systems. This is super cool. Um, recognize and take special care of systems that become integrated into the infrastructure of society. Commerce, travel, government, healthcare, education. When these systems are an important part of inf the infrastructure of society, we have additional responsibilities to be good stewards of the system. Wow, like you're signing up for a lot here if you're working on something we we'll might call infrastructure, um, which is interesting. So a lot goes into ethics here. Um, don't have too much more to talk about. Uh, so the lab on Tuesday, we're going to um, play around with the moral machine, which is, is a silly a little example here. Um, but you can set up a scenario, and we want to start, is it start judging, I think? We start judging. What should the self-driving car do? If there's nobody in it, should it keep driving and kill three people, or should it swerve and kill three animals? And you can make a description here. So we'll say, hey, we should do this, and you get to make choices. Should it do nothing and drive into the barrier and kill the passengers, or should it swerve, saving the passengers, killing the pedestrians? So this gets to be really interesting, uh, the principle of um, intervention or not. So the, the idea is the, the brakes have gone out, right? Uh, there's sudden brake failure. It will continue ahead if we don't do anything and the passengers will die. It just so happens to be an elderly man and a woman, or we could kill a regular man and a girl if we do intervene and swerve. 
So we get to make the choice, what do we think we should do here? What's the, what is the more moral choice? Forget whether or not a self-driving car can figure out if someone is old or not. Hey, I know this passenger's old, or I know this pedestrian's a kid. For, forget all that. You know, what should we do here? So some people fall on the side of no intervention, which is that let the car do what the car was going to do, and other people will, will go on the, the side of the car's job should be to, to protect the passengers, and it should intervene when protecting the passengers is important. And that's a moral choice. Uh, someone even proposed that cars have a dial for altruistic versus uh, self-preservation. So when you get in the self-driving car, you can say, okay, I want to be altruistic, save the, save the pedestrians, kill me, or I can turn the dial to, no, save me at all costs, run over any pedestrians you have to to keep the passenger alive. And let, let the, the passenger of the car make that choice, which is a little grim, um, but these are the sort of choices because something has to be coded in the software, right? What should a car do? What should the vehicle do if it has a sudden brake failure? Now, the car might not know that you're definitely 100% guaranteed going to die if you hit this thing here, and, you know, Cars are generally pretty safe when you hit things, right? I mean, not the most safe thing in the world, but they're generally pretty safe here. So you're going to make these choices here. Well, so what should we do? There's animals in the car. Should we do nothing and kill the animals, or should we kill the people? Okay, well, sure. If the car knows it's just driving my pet to the vet here, go for it. Should we do nothing, or should we swerve? Now, whether or not you know there's old people here or old people here, I don't know if that means anything. But should the car try and do something or try and not do something? Well, I mean, the same amount of people die here. Oh, a large man. So some of the choices, maybe your vehicle can determine whether or not someone is obese or not. So they must be more likely to die. Oh, sure. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll do nothing. And you get to make all these choices here. Right? Um, again, the not swerving, I think, is, I don't know. Now, these people are crossing when they're supposed to be, but someone's a criminal here. Should we run them over? because the car can't fail, or should we drive into the barrier and, oh, this person I think is a doctor. Yeah, the male doctor will die here instead of these other people here. And what should we do? These people, we don't know if they're jaywalking or not. Should we drive into the barrier or should we do nothing? And you, get a, there's also, and you can set up scenarios. These people are jaywalking. Should we kill the jaywalkers or should we swerve and kill the not jaywalkers? Well, obviously we should kill the jaywalkers. Should we... Kill the not jaywalkers or kill the jaywalkers? Should we swerve to hit the jaywalkers? Sure. And, and, and it's, it's, it's a little interesting. What do we do here? They're jaywalking. We should kill them. Um, not jaywalking. Oh, they're elderly, though. Should we kill the elderly or not kill the elderly? Right. I'm going to go with the non-intervention here. And eventually, when you do enough of these, uh, we'll say non-intervention, it gives you a little report of what was more common. Yeah, we'll just kill the dog. So saving more lives, does that matter a lot or not as much? Does protecting your passengers matter to you or doesn't matter a lot, right? It does not matter to protect the passengers or it does matter to protect the passengers. Does it matter if they're jaywalking or not, right? Does that affect your decisions? Avoiding intervention matters a lot or doesn't matter, right? I, I generally will fall in the let's avoid intervention if possible here. I think that's easier. That's probably just from a software perspective, easier to say we're going to avoid the interventions, because if then your software says, oh, I'm going to swerve and kill these people, well, you made, your software actively made the choice to do that, rather than, oops, the brake break lines failed, and this is what happened naturally. That was tough. Do you have a gender? Apparently, I prefer the men. Wow. I didn't know that. Uh, okay. Species preference. Do we pr prefer the humans or the pets? Yes. Age preference. Do we, are we going to kill the young people or the old people? The fit people. Are we going to kill the larger people or the athletes? And social value. Seriously? <laughs> there was like one question here. <laughs> Apparently, I value the doctors more than the criminals. Uh, but uh, this is, you can go and actually set up these sorts of things. You can design them yourself here and figure out what we're going to do um, and, and set up these scenarios. And the idea here is that we can sort of learn what the general public would have to say about morality and make these choices here. Whether or not that changes how we implement our vehicle or not, you know, that's something here. Um, so we'll play with this here, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, more about Uber um, as well. Uh, I want to find that, um, that Grayball article and then ask you to write a paragraph saying what you would do if you were assigned to the Grayball project. Right? And uh, like, like that one um, case study that was brief is, hey, they told management they're overcharging us, they're sub material, and the Code of Ethics said, well, if you want to keep complaining about it and take it up and report it, go for it, but if 
if you just said you did your duty, you did the right thing, we're fine with that too. And, and maybe that's what the choice is when it comes to gray ball. But I would like you to like formulate what your response would be and actually think that through and you know, this is what I would do if I was given this sort of project. Um, I think that one's interesting because uh, it's actually a legitimate project here. Um, or you could talk about um, cryptocurrency if you want. Although apparently Ethereum is moving to a proof of stake this year, moving away from the proof of work um, electricity burning system. So if that can happen, I'm super excited. We'll see. I may also have a lot of money tied up in Ethereum as well and be personally invested in it succeeding. So uh, we'll, we'll you know, put that caveat out there. Yeah, the HashMap lab, uh, we can talk about that. So let me open up, uh, uh, oh my goodness, PyCharm here. We'll take a look at that. So when we're doing the hash map lab, hash map lab, my goodness, um, grab this one here. So we want it to resize if it gets smaller, but no long, no less than 10%, um, and no smaller than the minimum size. So we're going to go find our hash map program and add in into the remove. We need to check to see if we should resize smaller. So let's go to our not the sorting project. Let's open. I think that was, yeah, hash maps was our project here. There we go. Excuse me. So as we remove things then, um, where's our delete item? Here's delete item. We should see if we need to resize here. So we need the another factor for resizing smaller. This is our load factor to increase here. How about a, I don't know, a shrink factor maybe? I don't know, whatever you want to call it. Here it's fine. 0.1. So let's say 10% for the shrink factor. We can say, okay, um, as we go delete a, a value here, we can say, hey, if my self dot number of items is greater than the starting value, uh, so it's self dot it, the starting initial capacity, uh, starting capacity. So if it's greater than the starting capacity and it is self dot less than the length of, or no, self dot. Um, less than the length of self dot storage times our self dot shrink factor. Right? So if we are over the, the starting capacity, which is our first requirement, so we can never get smaller than this, and we're less than 10% of the storage size, right? As that internal storage, the number of buckets that we have increases. If I have too many of those, we're going to be shrinking down. So if it is, then I need to resize. So the problem with resize here is that it doesn't take the factor. So what we want to do here is we want to take a factor for resize. And I can say, okay, let's multiply by the factor. So I could either double it or I could shrink it. Um, and then I also, now for our purposes, this will always be a whole number because we're going from 10 to 20, 20 divided by two will be 10, so on. But we want to make sure that it is an int value in case we ever use lengths that are not whole numbers here. Uh, which one do I not need? I don't need those parentheses, right? So just in case, it, you know, we're going to run into it, but it's, it's a good, good practice here. So if we're going to do that, then we'll call self.resize and we'll give it a factor of 0.5, right? We'll say go down by half here. We gotta find our other call to resize here. Uh, where's our other call to resize? Um, I think it was when we were adding items, right? Adding items, appending. Uh, oh, yep, thank you, 62. So we resize the factor of two, we wanna double. So, and maybe those should probably be um, in here. So, um, Give them some nice names so they're not those magic numbers here. So the load factor, um, so we'll say uh, fact, uh, growth factor maybe, growth factor, uh, does that make sense? And then a, a shrink factor. I don't know if those, those make any sense or not, but that way we don't have a you know just a number here. We can see, hey, this is what it is. So self.shrink factor. Yeah, oh no, not, did I already call that? Yeah, I did. Uh, Oh my goodness. Wait, I need to come up with better names here. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Diminish? <laughs> <laughs> uh, value to decrease size by. Sure. 
Why not? Uh, sometimes my variable names are not great here. And then how about we do this then? So value to increase size by is two, right? So we either double or we have. Again, not super interesting with these names, and we're probably not likely to change these sorts of things, but if we wanted to do some sort of optimization where we're trying to find the next proper prime number and other sorts of nonsense, uh, we could do that. So where we're resizing larger here in our 62, you said right? Yeah, resize self dot be able to increase size by. So both ways should work, right? In our resize method, we're just changing storage either to be bigger or smaller. And we already saw if we wanted to change that factor, I could jam 100 items into 10 buckets, right? If our factor was, hey, I can get up to 10 times my storage size, Python will let us do it, right? We are welcome to use those buckets. We could have a single bucket storing all of our data. It would not be efficient at all, but we could if we wanted to. Uh, again, that's why it's nice to have these sorts of things here. And we'll just go and re-add all the items here. So then we wanted to test it, right? Uh, make sure we can add and remove and check the lengths of the internal storage that's working as expected. So the internal storage should go from 10 to 20 when we need to grow after we get more than 75%. And then as we reduce items, when we get less than two items, it should shrink back down to 10. Right? It's kind of what we were doing to test that. So we'll make uh, another, so we'll say it uh, size testing equal to hash map here, and then we'll say for value in range. So if we add eight items, right, it should size up. We'll just do 10 here. Take our size testing key of the value. We'll just assign it value. Why not? So we get zero, zero, one is one for our maps here. And then we're going to print out the size testing dot storage and the length of that. Right, it's kind of, kind of messy actually going through and looking at these internal values, but Python lets us do it. Not good form, we're just testing this out here. A unit test would be more proper. Where we can actually go and test this sort of stuff out here. Um, let's see. Yeah, we'll just run that. So we should see the size should go up to 20 here. And then we start removing items. So then for value in range, let's do uh, 9. If we remove everything but the 10 here, we're going to take our size testing. We're going to delete size testing key of the value. And this delete syntax is super weird, but I'll, that I'll do it here. And we'll print the storage size again. It should go back down to 10 because we have one item left. Oh, it didn't yet. Uh-oh. Something's not working quite right then. So we want uh, less than or equal to, I think, our shrink factor. That might do it here. Nope, still at 20. Okay. Um, why is that not working there? Let's see. So remove the item. Well, the, the number of items should be down to 1 here. 1 should be less than the length of 20 times my shrink factor here. So let's put our, our breakpoint here and see what happens. And let's... Oh, uh, did we have the bug in resize? No, we did, uh, we did reduce storage. You took the number of items here. Oh, let's uh, run this in debug mode and see what happens. Actually, let's, uh, oh yeah, so we don't need the breakpoint there, so we'll continue on. All right, so we're deleting items. Hi. Uh, can you give me like five more minutes? Okay, thanks, I'll be right there. <laughs> uh, so we have currently, then, in our self, our hash map here, has our storage. We have one bucket, apparently here, length of zero. That's a, yeah, the, the lights don't work so well. There's a, another one that's missing. So have we not removed? We're deleting. What is the key we're deleting? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm in the delete of coffee is why. Sorry, we didn't want to stop there. So let me continue on. That's what I didn't notice here. So now we're deleting the key of zero. Okay, now we're deleting zero. So this should be fine. So we'll continue on. Deleting one, continue on, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, when I range to eight, I'm only deleting, uh, range to nine, I'm only deleting eight values here. But that should be, deleting eight should put me at 20%. So I think we should hit this here, right? My number of items is now one. Eight out of nine is 88%. So you still have 11%. About. Oh, I, I checked my number of items greater than capacity. That was wrong. So we want the length of storage 
here is greater than the starting capacity. That was the problem here. So yeah, let's give this one a shot and give that a run. Now we shrink back to 10. All right, so there we, there's the hash map lab, looking at that, making sure we can resize properly. Always good to test your stuff. Yeah, GG, oh, you've got Ethereum too, more than Bitcoin. Yeah, I think uh, Bitcoin hasn't announced plans to move to proof of stake. So I, I feel like uh, if Ethereum can pull it off, it'd be huge because that reduces the whole electricity waste as long as they don't let the system get hacked, which is the other risk, right? If, if you can have more than 50% uh, control of the network, uh, or you run into issues, but so here's hash map lab. All right, any other thoughts, questions, or concerns? Awesome, so on Tuesday then, um, we could do lab. I don't have plans for lecture, so if you want to, uh, the time is reserved to work on the final project, and again, on Thursday as well. There's no plans for lecture on Thursday. So I wasn't planning on coming to campus unless you want to meet. I'm happy to make the drive in if you want to meet. Um, if not, we'll just, um, we can meet remotely as well. We'll have that time set aside to meet with you or your, your groups, if you found a partner or not yet, to work on the final Yahtzee project. Um, and then next week, we'll do the ethics lab. Um, and then, so I'll, I'll plan to be here for the ethics lab. If you want to come in person, if not, we can chat about the final project during lab time. And then no lectures on the 19th or 21st. So just the one last lab, uh, I'll post that one for you folks. And then we're presenting, again, uh, 4 p.m. will be the planned start time because I've got uh, Dr. Swayman at 2.30. I should be done at home by then, but I'll let you know. All right, well, thanks, folks. You take care, and I'll see you around.